It has always been my aim to give you the best entertainment that money can buy. Hello everyone and welcome once again to the Laurel and Hardy Vlogcast and this is episode 3 and today's episode is a rather special one. As usual we're going to be discussing two of Stan and Babe's films and following the chronology this month we're focusing on Slipping Wives from 1927 and Love Him and Weep from the same year. And it's this film, Love Him and Weep, that gives us our special theme. Now, Laurel and Hardy were not headliners of Love Him and Weep. That honour went to May Bush, appearing in her first film with the boys, and also to James Finlayson. And so I've decided to dedicate this third episode to the man that gave the world... No! No! That sounds swell to me. I think it's good too. Yes, sir. How about you, Finn? Why, it's a knockout! Now, you may refer to him as Finn, Jimmy, Jim, Mickey Finn, or even Dr. Finlayson. But there really was only one James Finlayson. And to help me to uncover more about the life and career of this wonderful lad from Larbert in Scotland, my special guest today is Stephen Retty. Stephen has a very special connection to Mr. Finlayson, and you can find out more about that in just a minute. This is the proudest moment of my life. And so it's Patrick here with you from the Laurel and Hardy blog. Um, thanks again for being here with me for another episode. Before we get started, I just wanted to thank everyone for your continued support of the both well of both the, the blog and the podcast, um, and especially for all the wonderful comments that you've been sending me lately. In the last few days, I've set up a special Facebook group where we can all get together and share comments and share our, just basically our love for the boys. Um, I'm hoping to post some exclusive content on there very shortly as well. So if you'd like to be uh, a member of that, uh, one of our blogheads, please do look out um, for the group. Uh, the name is Blogheads, funnily enough, um, and I'm happy to say that it's filling up pretty fast. Uh, a big shout out to uh, Roy, and thank you, Roy, for being the very first blockhead to join. Um, thanks to Ali for inviting so many of her contacts to join us as well. Uh, well, actually, Ali made me uh, smile the other day. She uh, she contacted me to say she was terrified that she may have missed episode three of this podcast, and that made my day. So thank you very much, Ali, and I hope you are listening. And thanks also, especially to my good friend Alex, who has agreed to be a moderator of the group. And one other new addition over the past month that I'm happy to report is the creation of my Laurel and Hardy blog, Amazon Store. In there you can find um, a ton of quality related products that I recommend from the best Blu-ray and DVD releases to the best books on the boys as well. Um, there's also clothing, collectibles, various other bits of Laurel and Hardy merchandise. And any purchase that you make also helps to support this podcast and the blog too, so please do check that out. And so without any further ado and any more idle falderdash, I think it's time we got on with the show. Now, I'm very excited to introduce our special guest today, as he's someone with a very close connection to the world of Laurel and Hardy. Uh, it's not just because he's a lifelong fan of Stan and Ollie. It's not just because he's one of the founder members of the Our Relations Tent of the Sons of the Desert. His name is Stephen Retty, and I'm going to let him explain his extra special connection to you. So let's get underway by saying, Stephen, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy blogcast. Hi, Patrick. Thanks for having me on the show. Basically, I'm lucky enough to be uh, related to James in that my great grandmother and James's mother were sisters. So that makes me James's first cousin twice removed. Twice removed. Fantastic. So we have a, we have a, a family member on board for the first time on the broadcast. That's really exciting. I think you've probably in one stroke up my six degrees of separation somewhat there to the world of Laurel and Hardy. So thank you for that immediately. Um, well, this is ex this is great. Um, James Finlayson is obviously one of the, if not the favourite uh, of supporting actors in the world of Laurel and Hardy. Um, certainly is, is, is up there for me. Um, yet I know very little about his background, so I'm really excited to talk to you today, Stephen, and find out as much as we can about uh, about James Finlayson. Um, as you know, we are looking at two films today on the blogcast. So we're looking at Slipping Wives, 1927, and then the next film that they filmed together, which of course is Love Him and Weep, which stars, I should say stars, because it was his film with Mae Bush, stars Mr. Finlayson. So uh, this is the ideal time to get you on. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, so before we kick off and we talk about uh, James, could we just have a little chat about what your Laurel and Hardy backstory is? How did how you discovered them? You know, what your sort of earliest memories are? Well, I remember 
I remember watching um, Laurel and Hardy on television. Um, I think it was maybe this, maybe the 1970s, I think when they were on, either during the school holidays or on I think Sunday mornings perhaps, maybe on BBC Two. But I remember them watching the films and I, it, what stuck in my mind was, I remember my mum saying, that, that old man there is your, is your grand's cousin. <laughs> I'm going, I'm going, How can he be my grand's cousin? Because that's it's a black and white film, it's nearly <laughs> ages ago. And he's, he's an old man, so how could he be my grand's cousin? Um, so that, that stuck in my head for ages, I guess. And I happened to be doing, uh, I did a genealogy evening classes at Strathclyde University. And it was, you know, what project should I pick sort of thing to, to get started on, on looking up your family history. I thought, well, I'm looking at this allegation that um, I'm related to James. And so it turned out to be true. So... I managed to find all these initial records which proved um, that it was indeed my grand cousin. That's amazing. So so to start with, then, you were actually watching the films before you knew about the connection. So, Oh, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like a case of, oh, you're related, therefore you must watch these programmes. <laughs> um, it was just typical child watching TV and, and starting to enjoy these programmes. And I must have watched them a lot. And then I remember just remember one day my mum saying this, we had this connection. I was like, <laughs> you're having a laugh. You know? <laughs> So, so, so was that kind of a, I mean, how long was it before you actually started looking into it? Was it kind of like a family, sort of not a myth, but one of the family legends for a while before you actually decided to look into it? Yeah, like I say, I don't remember talking about them. And in fact, recently, um, my sister has actually told me that my mum told her that James was regarded as a black sheep of the family and that nobody really talked about him. I, I going away and becoming an actor was seen as a, not really a great job opportunity sort of thing in those days at the turn of the century so and I, I guess I guess I, I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not but uh, like I say I, that's what I heard which may explain why I didn't talk that much about him you know yeah that's interesting because I mean obviously it didn't you know it didn't turn out badly for him he, he did pretty well out of it I would I would imagine um, and from what I understand and I hope well, I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to this didn't he return to 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 Scotland a few times afterwards and help out local charities and things is that right he did return to Larbor every time he went on his summer holidays. He'd always return to, he seemed to enjoy London and Paris. So I think every, every, it seemed like every year, I mean, I've checked this out in like passenger list records and stuff like that, um, he would go back and he would always go, always go back to Larbor. So there's quite a few instances where the local paper, which is the Falkirk Herald, has a lot of reports about him coming back to the area. There's some great wee stories. Um, I think there's one from, I think it's 1925, maybe. And that he came and did a, he did a, a lecture on the day in the life of a Hollywood actor. And he brought, I can't remember how many thousand feet of film and showed this, showed this to the, and, and it's, it's, I think it's one of the old picture houses, no longer there. I can't remember what the, the comment by the, the journalist was. It was, you know, it was fairly interesting or something like that. I can't remember <laughs> the quote, but it's like, really? This guy comes all the way from Hollywood and, and she gets a projector set up and, and shows you his, the life and it's, it's only mildly amusing or something like that, whatever he said. What are you trying to do? Make me out a bigger fool than I look, than I am. So the first thing that when I started investigating uh, his background was that in the 1901 census, he's 13 years old and he's working as a tinsmith, um, as is his older brother, uh, Alexander, and his father's a blacksmith. Apparently a blacksmith deals with hot metal and a tinsmith deals with cold metal. So I thought, well, that seems a bit odd. I'm sure, is this the right guy I've got? How is he a tinsmith? And eventually I found an article, which again, in the Falkirk Herald, which he, when he came back to a lab at one time, it revealed the, the, the foundry where he worked. It was a Torwood foundry. Um, and on one occasion he comes back and he actually makes a dustpan to prove he's still got, still got it. And I actually found his mother died when he was 16. Um, I don't know if you probably know that Stan Laurel's died. Stan Laurel's mum died in Glasgow when she was eight, when he was eighteen. Um, and actually, six years after his death, his father died as well. So when he was twenty-two, he was orphaned um, together with the the three. Well, at that time, there was three surviving brothers and three surviving sisters. And I've subsequently worked out his cousin, who they actually called him their uncle, uh, David Aiken Finlayson. He actually adopted the younger children, certainly. Basically, when James and his and his brother, young brother Robert, uh, go across to America, it's to see the, the address they're going to is David's address in New York. So there's a bit, it, it kind of blows away the myth that um, James was working in, with a theatre company and went across, like you know, like Stan Laurel did with Fred Carmack, etc. 
at well, that, that time when, when his father died, he was actually, he already started acting in amateur dramatics. I think that the, the company changed its name various times. It's the Stenhouse Muir and Larbert Amateur Dramatic Society. So he made his debut at the Dobby Hall, which is a, a fabulous um, small theatre just along the road from his house, actually, which is not far from where he worked. So it became professional, we ended up working with the, the John Clyde Theatre Company. Now, John Clyde happens to be Andy Clyde's dad, silent film comedian. It seems that they, they probably met at this time, and obviously later on they were very close uh, friends over in, over in the States, as, as in fact Andy was with uh, James' young brother, Robert. So basically, yeah, so basically, the reason he's in New York is because his family's all there, because um, basically they've left uh, Larbert. His, o- his oldest brother... Alexander basically inherited the house, the family house. Alexander subsequently joined the two, the other two, his two younger brothers over in California. And it's essentially a dynamic that the three brothers all stayed over in California and the three sisters all stayed over in Long Island in New York. But, it, but they were clearly very close. Um, in fact, I found various times that Robert, his younger brother, is staying just like, you know, up the road from James in Los Angeles. Um, and also close to Andy Clyde. So clearly a tight, a tight knit uh, group, if you like. Yeah, so James basically finds himself in New York being an actor and somehow ends up appearing on Broadway. Presumably, well, the first play, I think, I think there was a, there's this, there's this play called Bundy Pulls the Strings, which is a kind of, seems to be like a Scottish musical drama. So I found various, various um, plays where he appears in, in New York. But so they seem to tour. Uh, all over, initially in like Northeast America and also into Canada, into Canada and then subsequently across, all across to California. So this, these plays seem to be very popular uh, and you think, well, why is it so popular? It's because there's so many Scottish immigrants. They're missing home, so they seem to appreciate, oh, it's nice to hear a Scottish voice again or whatever, or just to hear songs and have a sing-along, whatever. There's hundreds of shows. I was also lucky enough to find uh, an interview he did, I think, in 1916 in the Boston Hill, um, in which he, the interviewer m- remarks of how you know, he looks quite tired and like old. He went, well, part of it's because I've done all these shows. Part of it is because it's just the natural way I look sort of thing. So, and what, if you look at the, the pictures, you see his father's quite baldy. James, even at 11, is maybe receding a bit. Um, so what, what he says is that, I'm ble- I'm, I'm, in a way, I'm blessed with my parents because I've been able to play so many old men's parts. All the, the, the parts he seems to have is he's, he's playing his old men. He's playing, I think he's, the first reference I get to him being in a, well, one of the amber dramatic plays is, so he's playing an old, an old vicar, basically. And that's in like 1904. So he looks very old, but actually he's only, he's only three, I think it's less than three years older than Stan Laurel. So you think, and some, some things you see, they look like a massive gap, but it's like it's just because he's, he has that appearance. I've actually, I've actually got, a, I've got a photograph from my my gran who in her forties, and she actually looks like a grandmother when she was forty. Um, so anyway, seemed, it seemed like he was lucky enough to get all these parts because um, of his, his looks, if you like, which I guess a lot, a lot of actors do, and maybe get typecast, which he, he probably did. <laughs> if you look at a lot of the films, he's playing old past some or other. So they're tracing through his, if you like, the theatre career. Um, the last play I can find them in is in 1917. Now, according to his World War One draft registration card, US draft registration card, he was working at the LKO, the Lehman Knockout Comedies. Um, but I've not managed to find any like actual film credits at that time. And one little, sorry, one little small snippet of interesting information about the, the draft registration card is that there's a space where it mentions like physical deformities as to why you wouldn't be called up. And he, he has written um, Missing Two Left Toes. And I thought, well, that's a bit weird. So it's a bit of a joke. But what I think was maybe it could have perhaps been an industrial accident when he was working as a tinsmith. So and I didn't think anything about that for a while. And then I was reading uh, Randy Skrevitt's book. And he tells a wee story. I think it's some... I think it's some 20-year-old, 21-year-old's birthday party. Anyway, she... she invites all these people around to a birthday party and it's during prohibition and they, they make a bathtub of gin and obviously getting very drunk and at the party is James Finlayson, Mickey Rooney and um, Judy Garland and this this woman recounts a story where they started, suggested they play strip poker and uh, apparently James got down to his shoes and socks and 
he took off his socks and then started making jokes about the fact that his toes were missing. He like put his fingers down and pulled them away, going, "Oh look, I've bent my two toes and I've lost." <laughs> but, um, but the story's good because it, it corroborates the, the the fact that um, he had to, uh, toes missing. How else would you do that? <laughs> That's what you need, isn't it? So there's actually there's a, I think there's, a, there's one of the films. I think it's Ladies Night at the Turkish Bath, where I think he's actually in the bath, and it's it's difficult to see. Did he have a stunt double doing the the the, the scene with the the feet in the water? You can't really, you can't quite make out if it's if 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 the toes are missing or not. So like say nineteen seventy, so nineteen eighteen, I can't find any information about him whatsoever anywhere. And it's occurred to me just recently that obviously the, the nineteen eighteen pandemic was on at that time. I think perhaps a lot of the studios shut down, so there might not have been a lot of films getting made at that time. Our first film in focus today is Slipping Wives. It was a two-reeler filmed October 20th to November 3rd, 1926, and released on April the 3rd, 1927. It was produced by Hal Roach, directed by Fred Gill, with titles by H.M. Walker. The main cast were Priscilla Dean, Herbert Rawlinson, Albert Conti, and of course Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. There's probably not really a huge amount to say about Slipping Wives, uh, for some reason, my memories of watching it many years ago weren't positive ones. And although I wasn't really looking forward to revisiting it, actually, I needn't have worried. It's actually quite enjoyable. Although Stan and Babe are not a team in this film, they do appear in scenes together. And when they do, their on-screen chemistry is certainly evident. To say the boys were not a team is actually downplaying it somewhat, as Babe's character spends most of the film trying to find his way to kill Stan. Here, Babe Hardy plays butler to an artist, played by English-born Herbert Rawlinson. Rawlinson is so focused on his work that he's neglecting his wife, played by Priscilla Dean. Stan, on the other hand, plays the part of Ferdinand Flamingo, an innocent paint delivery man who is hired against his will to make the artist-slash-husband jealous. Stan, of course, makes a complete hash of all of this, as you would expect. He even mistakes another man for her husband, so he wastes all of his efforts in front of the wrong guy much to Priscilla Dean's annoyance. Sound familiar? It should. The plot was revisited and reworked for the boys' 1935 short, The Fixer Uppers. Interestingly, in this later film, Stan tells Ollie and May Bush, whose husband has become neglectful of her, You know what? I knew a woman once that had a case just like yours. But you know what she did? She got a fella to make love to her in front of her husband, and it made the husband jealous. Then what happened? Well, eh? So what? Well, when the husband got jealous, his wife knew that he was in love with her, just because he was jealous. You see, and if he hadn't have been jealous, then he wouldn't have paid any attention to the fellow that, that made him jealous. See? Well, what'd the husband do? Take a gun and go out and shoot the other fellow? No, when the husband found out he was so pleased that he was jealous, he took his wife in his arms and he kissed her, and, and then they went out again and they got married all over. And then he kissed her again. Now, and... just a minute. What happened to the other fellow? Well, when the husband found out he was jealous, he was so pleased that the other fellow had made him jealous, he gave the other fellow a lot of money because it made him jealous, and they, they all lived happy ever after. There's really something quite satisfying about this nod to their previous work, especially the original film. As here, in The Fixer Uppers, Stan is clearly describing himself in his role as Ferdinand Flamingo in Slipping Wives some eight years earlier. So as mentioned, despite the boys being anything but a team, in the conventional sense of the word, there are several moments in the film where they get to interact and their magic really does have the chance to shine through, and shine through it does. For instance, within seconds of Butler Ollie answering the door to Stan, they engaged in a comic tussle on the doorstep. It's a classic bit of Laurel and Hardy business. And so too is the scene in which Ollie is chasing Stan around the bedroom trying to force him to take a bath. It's all very pleasing stuff to watch, and very well worth watching for any Laurel and Hardy fan. This is also the first film in which the boys share a bed. The reason for this is Ollie is ensuring he can keep a very close and suspicious eye on Stan through the night, making sure he doesn't do a runner. While the clean-shaven butler's character doesn't bear much resemblance, either appearance or personality-wise, to the Ollie that we know and love, Stan is actually getting quite visibly closer to perfecting his recognisable mannerisms. 
Here we see that glorious wide smile and his naive embarrassment at being told to make love to the artist's wife. He still displays that frenetic, volatile energy carried through from his solo career, but little by little the Stanley character is emerging. In her day, Priscilla Dean was quite a notable star in the silent film era, and although she is the film's headliner, it is, for all intents and purposes, a Stan Laurel comedy, at least in my eyes, with everyone else playing supporting roles. Paint delivery man Stan is introduced to the inattentive husband as Lionel Ironsides, a famous writer of fairy stories. And there's a particularly memorable scene, possibly the best scene in the entire film, that sees Stan wonderfully performing the tale of Samson and Delilah in front of his hosts, its real true pantomime fashion harking back to his music hall and vaudeville training and roots. The film eventually turns into a basic bedroom farce of mistaken identity and crossed purposes. A contemporary review in Moving Picture World from April 23rd, 1927 was actually very positive, particularly about the straight actors. Slipping Wives, Pathé, Two Reels. Not one, but two well-known stars of feature productions are offered by Hal Roach in the case of this two-reeler, Priscilla Dean and Herbert Rawlinson. With several of the familiar Roach comedians in support, making this an exceptional aggregation even for a Hal Roach comedy. The presence of the stars, together with the good word of the supporting players, plus amusing situations and gags, should make this a good attraction for any type of audience. Miss Dean is cast as a wife who is losing her husband's love. She hires another man to make love to her, and between this and the fact that he mistakes another friend for the real husband, he manages to ball everything up for the merriment of the spectator. In the main, it is farce comedy, although Stan Laurel in the role of the paid lover introduces considerable slapstick. So all in all, I found this quite an enjoyable film. It's got quite a few good laugh-out-loud moments. Uh, my favourite one of those being when Stan, who's bowing low to return a greeting, I think from the husband, he, uh, he bows a little too low and headbutts the piano. <laughs> um, it's a, certainly a step closer to the finished article for Stan, but sadly Ollie's character still has some miles to go before he becomes our recognisable friend. And here's Stan talking in 1959 with interviewer Bill Raby. Next one, there was a picture with Priscilla Dean and Herb Rawlinson. Uh, I'm trying to think what the name of that picture was. Anyway, uh, Dave and I were in that picture, although we went as a team. Uh, we did come together in the picture, although we had no connection in the story. So, uh, Roach liked that one. Keep on doing that, and I kept on making the pictures, and finally it evolved. The rook just uh, says, We'll make the lol hardy comedy. That's all. So from then on, he has evolved and developed. The characters evolved, they developed. <laughs> So that was the audio blog on Slipping Wives. Now let's find out what Stephen has to say about the film. What's, uh, what's your take on Slipping Wives from a fan's perspective, Stephen? Um, yeah, I think what, what interests me is that, um, like I was saying, I love this, this idea of how Roach has of having stars from, uh, not from com- not comedy stars, but like stars from normal drama films, uh, Priscilla Dean and I guess Herbert Rawlinson. Um, but it's interesting that, like, say that he also thought of it's basically Stan Laurel as the, the, the sort of comedic element. But the, the, what's interesting is the, the gags they do with um, Oliver Hardy. There's a lot of uh, signature gags that you you, you recognise from later on. Um, you know, there's, there's Stan doing his um, sort of shy, twee, embarrassed act. Um, when his wife's the wife suggesting that they pretend to make love. Um there's like all of her hard knocking on the door and hiding the key and they chase around the room. Uh, and that sort of panto stuff. Um, um one of the one of the one of the bits I like, I like especially was the when uh Ollie gets like splattered with paint. Um he did you know he does that 
he does that look, I think, when it, like looking to the camera, straight to the camera. And I, I always think, I, I don't know if you watched, you watched Modern Family, like an American TV show. Um, they do a lot of that, they're like, you know, they're acting away and all of a sudden they get, they'll go like that and they'll, they'll look right at the camera. And it's just, and I'm thinking, they get that from all over Hardy. Um, it's also, and, and also one of the things is, is he's got that thing where he, where he's sort of shaking the paint off. He does that thing with his hands. You know, he's, like, he's a big guy, but he's yes, like being yeah. kind of delicate. You know? Very so, delicate. That's right. Yeah, and it, but as you say, even even then, he's doing that. Yeah. Those the, those mannerisms are there. So I, think, I think it's yeah. it's you can definitely see the if you like the um, you know the embryo of, of them working so well together, um, even though it's not a Laurel yeah. Hardy film. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's no, that's right. From from that very first moment when 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 Babe opens the door to Stan, it's just hilarious that little scuffle on the doorstep, as you say, which ends up with the paint pots and yeah, the magic is definitely on show, isn't it? Absolutely. And it just, and I just think it's so incredible that it wasn't kind of harnessed straight away because it's just it leaps off the off the screen to you when when they when they're together and they're racing mm-hmm. around the bathroom and you know all of that. Um, no, you're absolutely right. And as you say, um, I think the, one of Roach's strategies was to try and uh, get under contract these. I think they called them falling stars. These, you know, celebrities that had been big stars and they were just kind of like fading from popularity, but still had that uh, mm. box office appeal. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Theda Barra uh, was one in Forty Five Months from Hollywood, and yeah, Priscilla Dean, um, and then you know, just a few in just a few films' time. The, the stars are are Stan and Babe themselves. Yeah, it's really obviously, they, like I say, I think they, they they must have watched the film back and saw something. I dare say the audience reaction. Although you know, it's, it's interesting to see uh, um, con, this con, like the contemporary reviews. If like you're all talking about Priscilla Dean, I'm going, I've not heard of Priscilla Dean. Who's who's she? I actually thought they, they that was like in the, the final scene where it's like a you know a sort of bedroom farce, you know. I thought that actually the straight actors played that quite well, you know, that one about and getting shot in the backside and all that sort of stuff. That's right. Yeah, yeah, they were very good. Yeah, funnily enough, I was watching it this afternoon with uh, my two young boys. Um, I've got uh, eldest is seven and the youngest one is four, and I said, "Come on, we'll sit down and we'll watch this uh, this film, Slipping Wives." I thought I'll see how long they last with this one, and you know, they were absolutely in stitches. They loved it. I mean, they like Laurel and Hardy anyway. They've got no choice. You know, it's kind of enforced. You will like Laurel and Hardy, but yeah, they they loved it. They thought it was hilarious. They, they, especially when the um, yeah the guy gets shot in the backside twice, one, one from underneath. <laughs> they, they thought it was brilliant. So it's it's great to see you know. And I mean, I think I said in my, in my blog that um, when I sort of came to sit down and watch Slipping Wives, I hadn't seen it for many. For, for some reason, I thought, oh, I'm not going to enjoy this. This is going to be turgid kind of affair. I'm going to have to just sit through it. But that's really enjoyable film. It's a really funny little comedy, I think. Um, and of course, it has a. Um, it's remade years later as um, the Fixer Uppers. I think the thing with the silent films, I don't know if you think the same. They just move so much quicker because they're not burned with di- with dialogue. It just it's it just flows a lot quicker and it just has more energy to it. I find it comes quite annoying when the the title comes up. Like I, I've read that. Move on. Move on. I mean, I hadn't actually watched a lot of silent film before I embarked on this. And I actually found, you know, they're really quite fascinating. Um, and it's, you know, it's a, it is a different kettle of fish, if you like. And there's, all the, there's, all the, there's that sort of exaggeration because there's no dialogue, there's no spoken dialogue. Um, I think that's part of the thing that uh, I think kids especially appreciate. Oh, what has that got to do with me? So I think that's Slipping Wives just about covered. So back to the interview with Stephen. The way I started looking at his films was doing it in, like, if you like, reverse order, going back from Laurel Hardy. Obviously, a lot, all the Laurel Hardy films are well documented and researched. And I was obviously aware of them. I thought, how did he get into, you know, from being a Tinsmith and Labert to being Laurel Hardy? So going back to the, if you like, before he started in Howard Roach, he was at Max Sennett. Um, and that's where I discovered, I had no idea he was so like famous. You know, at that point, masses of films he's in. Um, it's also, and he also has a special 
with a, he had a special relationship with uh, Ben Turpin. Ben Turpin signed James's declaration of intention to apply for U.S. citizenship, and James is also a pallbearer at Ben's funeral, um, as was Andy Clyde. But you can see from the films, and obviously they run a lot of films together. And at that time, James is kind of playing baddie roles, if you like. He's very much the the villain of the piece. Most of them. He signed in October 1919. I think he left in 1923. So he had four years there. Now, one of the other interesting things about that period of time, is going much forward to his his death, his obituaries all point out, all mention that he was a, a Keystone cop. And that is seen as the, the biggest thing that people remember about him. And Laurel and Hardy sometimes gets a mention, sometimes doesn't, which again intrigued me because it's not how people think of him now. So I haven't quite made up my mind whether he, he was a Keystone cop or not. Um to actually did get definitive evidence at the Max Ennett times. Now what what he did do though was I can't remember the date, but much later on. He was a, a charter member of the, the Maskers Club, which is like the forerunner of the Screen Actors Guild. Um, so it was like a, um, I feel like a club, initially a club, if you like, for actors. But they actually made their own films. Uh, as a film they made, uh, is it Stout Hearts and Willing Minds, I think it's called, um, where he, the part of the, on, on the, in the films, the Keystone Cops. So he was one of the Keystone Cops in that film. Um, along with lots, lots of the other old timers, if you like. Now, that may be stuck in people's minds. Um, he made a lot of public appearances later on um, as a Keystone cop, if you like. Um, but that's obviously a wee side job to occasionally turn up, put a police uniform on, and sign autographs and get paid for doing so. I don't know. Um, and there's also a very, there's a, a great article I found. Um, it's actually quite near before you die. I think it was three years before he died. There was a, a Shriners um, event in the Los Angeles Coliseum, which seats 90,000 people, or did in those days. And it's about a big floodlit show, etc. cetera. And, um, it was actually, I think it was compared by Cecil B. DeMille. Um, and there's one part of it where the, these Model T cars drive around the track. And he, James is one of the Keystone cops in the car likes the Hank Man, etc. To my mind, that resonates with the, his obituaries that he seemed to have been known as a Keystone cop. Well, like I say, I think it's maybe he wasn't an original, certainly wasn't one of the original members. Um, yeah. But I'll be, it's, it's, it seemed like anybody could be a Keystone cop. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> he was sort of sitting, sitting about in the set one day. He signed with Max Sennett on the 6th of October 1919. And he was paid... $95 a week for the first three months and then received an increase to $120 for the next three months after that. I found that really fascinating that there was all this huge canon of work, if you like. I mean, one of the one of the best uh, surviving films is, is Down on the Farm, which was made in 1920, 100 years ago, and it's been restored by I think, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And it's really interesting to watch that film because James is like the it's like he's almost a link between a number of sketches, lots of sort of live action. Um, he's he's a sort of link between the, the various sketches, including having a fight with Ben Turpin, which seems to be a, a common theme. Um, and there's actually there's actually a, a, a partner where he rides a horse. <laughs> it's, it's just is it, is it him doing it as well. It's him doing it, yeah. Oh, I, think, well, I, I, I don't know a skill he, he didn't know he had. He, <laughs> He can knock out dustpan that he can ride a horse, you know what I mean? <laughs> so again, and back then, obviously, I think there's later on there's references to him saying that because there were so many actors involved, they were all kind of trying to outdo each other. Hence hence why they make the, the sort of exaggerated faces. Uh, okay. they're, all, they're all basically, maybe they're all, there's three of them in a scene, they're all trying to outdo each other. <laughs> You know, trying to say, oh, I'm better than him. And, you know, it's all the over-exaggeration, you know. Like, look at me, look at me, sort of thing. And it's funny how the, the publicity for Down the Farm says, you know, James, James is a, a legitimate actor of screen and stage. That's how he's, he's, he's sort of nice. portrayed. So obviously, they're also recognising that he's had a career in the theatre, which a lot of the guys didn't have. A lot of them, are, you know, I guess a lot of different backgrounds, but 
Um, and one other thing that struck me was the number of people who weren't Americans. That you know, yeah. there's a lot of these guys who are Australians, say, um, you know, like um, I think Billy Bevan and Clyde Cook. You know, I always thought it was a big magnet that, that when the you know Hollywood first sort of started coming to life. It's also a, a big a big draw for people all over the world who, um, you know, were entertainers. Um, but it's, it must have been quite a leap to make to come all the way to, to California and the chat off chance of getting, getting into a movie, you know. Like, I've seen some things that say he was basically in the, maybe the A-team, if you like, of the, the league of uh, Mac, the, the college, collegiate system, if you like, in Max Sennett. Um, now, it seems that he was at that at, well, after those four years, that Max Ant decided not to do comedies anymore and was more into doing like dramas, which seems like a, now it seems like a bit crazy. Tell me that again, eh? Let me hear that again. We'll return to the interview with Stephen in just a few moments, uh, but before that, we'll have a look at the second film in focus today, which is Love Him and Weep. This was a two-reeler, filmed Friday. November 26th through Tuesday, December the 7th, 1926, and it was released June 12th, 1927. It was produced by Hal Roach, directed by Fred Gill, with titles by H.M. Walker. The main cast were Mae Bush, Jimmy Finlayson, Stan Laurel, Oliver Hardy, Charlotte Mino, Vivian Oakland, and Charlie Hall also makes an appearance. One step forward and two steps back. That's how I can only describe the team's development when it comes to Love Him and Weep. Ollie's action in this film is very limited indeed, with only about 45 seconds or so of screen time, and hardly appearing in the same shot as Stan at all. In addition, although Stan is prominent throughout the movie, it's not a Stan Laurel comedy either. Moving Picture World from June 18th, 1927 announced Love Him and Weep, Pathé, Two Reels. May Bush is Hal Roach's feature star for this two-reel comedy, which proves to be a fast-moving and mirthful farce that should please the general public. This was headline in May Bush's first picture for the Hal Roach studio, and indeed with Stan and Babe. She does a typically wonderful performance playing the role of a devious diva, a real no-nonsense dame. Australian-born Bush had f enjoyed a fairly prominent career on the Broadway stage until she eventually went to work at the Keystone studio working for Max Sennett. But according to Leo M. Brooks, the Laurel and Hardy stock company, just as she was getting close to becoming a movie star in her own right, she was caught up in a Hollywood scandal that slammed the brakes on her movie career. Around the middle of 1916, it was reported that May was having an affair with Sennett, and the lovers were discovered by Sennett's fiancée, screen star Mabel Normand. May was left with little choice but to walk away from Senate, and as a result she disappeared from the public eye altogether, resurfacing three years later in a Paramount feature entitled The Grim Game, and then again the following year in Eric von Stroheim's hit movie The Devil's Passkey. From here, May began to appear more regularly in various movies, hopping from studio to studio, but never quite breaking through as a headliner. Eventually Hal Roach recognised May's potential and signed her to his studio. Despite May Bush and James Finlayson taking the lead roles, there is still something very satisfyingly familiar with the picture for Laurel and Hardy fans. In addition to Stan, Babe, May Bush and James Finlayson, Love Him and Weep is also the first of the boys' films to feature Birmingham-born Charlie Hall. Hall, a carpenter by trade, emigrated from the UK in 1920 and had worked with Stan on a number of solo pictures previously. In fact, author and Laurel and Hardy both, John Uller, identifies Stan's 1923 solo Mother's Joy as Charlie's film debut. Affectionately known by Laurel and Hardy fans around the world as the little nemesis, Hall would go on to appear in 47 comedies with the boys, more than any other supporting actor, although many of these were very small parts, in some cases appearing as just an extra in a crowd. James Finlayson, as always, is the real deal. In fact, I can't recall ever seeing a film with the Scotsman in where he hasn't put in a scene-stealing, if not movie-stealing, performance. In this film, he plays the part of the wealthy and married businessman, Titus Tilsbury. 
Tilsbury enrolls the somewhat reluctant help of employee Romaine Ricketts, Stan, to deal with an old flame, Maybush, who has suddenly reappeared at Tilsbury's office with an incriminating photo of them both together from years ago. It's amusing to note what sort of image was considered incriminating to a 1920s audience, certainly compared to today's standards. As with many of the boys films, this storyline would be reused and remade four years later as the sound short Chickens Come Home, but for that outing Hardy would be much more prominent, taking over Finlayson's role as the wealthy businessman, and Finlayson in turn would take over Charlie Hall's role as the businessman's butler. Using her incriminating photo, May Bush forces Finlayson to agree to meet her that very evening to discuss the sale of said photo over dinner at the Pink Pup. All seems set, and Bush is about to leave when Finlayson's wife unexpectedly appears at the office. Bush is forced to hide in Finlayson's ensuite bathroom, which his wife, played by Charlotte Minot, needs to use. It becomes quite farcical and stressful for Finlayson, as his wife stands washing her hands with his old flame turned blackmailer standing just inches away. Fortunately for Finlayson, the two ladies are kept apart, but Mrs. Tilsbury informs her husband that they are to host a dinner party that evening for some very distinguished guests. Aware that he would be able, unable to get out of this engagement, and realising that it would not be wise to leave Bush alone at the restaurant, Stan is instructed to take Finlayson's place at dinner, with firm instructions to keep her away from Tilsbury's house, and more importantly his wife, at all costs. Upon arriving at the Pink Pup, Stan is naturally very nervous. He is, after all, out on the town with a formidable and conniving woman who does not appear to suffer fools gladly. All this without his wife's knowledge too makes for a very stressful and nervy fellow. There are some very funny moments throughout this film. I particularly like the part where Stan in his awkwardness falls down the stairs after entering the Pink Pup. Whilst attempting to placate his boss's blackmailer, Stan is spotted by none other than the neighbourhood busybody slash gossip, and, her, and he immediately realises that word will soon reach his wife that he's been courting another woman. To make matters worse, not only is Stan unable to pacify May Bush, but he is also seemingly powerless to prevent her from storming over to the Tilsbury residence. Naturally, chaos ensues on her arrival during the house party, at which a thickly mustachioed Ollie, playing the part of Judge Chigger, and his wife are in attendance. Ollie's part is restricted merely to an amused witness to the scenes of mayhem, and there's not an inkling of the familiar Ollie character in this film. Stan, on the other hand, seems really to be starting to hone his character, building on the previous two films. His main characteristics are the slow-witted innocence, and on a number of occasions he even displays his now trademark cry. This is actually not a bad film, with Laurel and Finlayson working well together, and May Bush bounces off both of them effortlessly and with great effect. The real shame is that Babe Hardy was not used more, but his time would come, and when it did, it would be forever. <laughs> Okay, um, and just uh, the, so the second film, which is a little bit more relevant to to yourself, is um, Love Him and Weep again from the same year, nineteen twenty seven. Um, what are your thoughts on Love Him and Weep, Stephen? Yeah, what's what's interesting about that is that Stan's effectively uh, James's sidekick. Yeah. Um, so it's actually more of a you could argue it's more of a Finlayson and Laurel film than a, a Laurel and Finlayson film even. Yeah, well, actually, it's I think it's it's accredited as a, a May Bush James Finlayson film, mm. with with extras, um, yeah, as, as Stan Laurel Oliver Hardy. So they are they're way down there. It's not um, not even a question. It's it's definitely um, James's film with May Bush. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost to be honest, it's almost a you wonder why Oliver Hardy was even in the film because it doesn't it doesn't do anything other than get, I think he gets punched in the stomach by, by his, from his wife that's right. towards the end. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Again, maybe it's some contractual obligation that he was he was you know forced to work that day, sort of thing. It's the same as um, as in as Stan Laurel, I guess, in Forty Five Minutes from Hollywood. You know, it could have been anybody. In fact, it could have been James Finlayson because he had the big moustache sitting in the bed um, in the hotel. But um, uh, yeah, I think they just in the in the Roach All Stars, they just dragged anybody in who uh, yeah who they probably got on hand. Really, it, it's such a shame to because he was so underused in that film and it's one of those frustrating things where you think in Slipping Wives they've got such good chemistry together Stan and Babe and you think well they, they will have noticed that so the next film is going to be even better 
and it just goes back a step and Babe's hardly in it, you know. But but then they, and then you know you look further down the line and flying elephants turns up, um, and that is nothing anywhere near what, what the the characters are, are like. You know they totally go off uh, off script on that one, and again again Finn listens in that one, isn't he? Um, there's just yeah, it, it's a bit mind boggling how they didn't kind of think, hang on, we've got two really good actors that work well together with a good supporting cast. Let's build on that, build on that, but. One of the frustrations of the uh, of the timeline, but it's it's interesting to see. It's really interesting to see the the characters building up. What I've noticed is that obviously a lot of these films were were re released later on after this, the long had to become such a big success. And I feel like James Finlayson is kind of airbrushed out of out of it in a, in a lot of respects. You see a lot of his movie posters, or well, posters for presumably uh, reshowings maybe later on, and like you know. Uh, well, there's one, I think the one on the Wikipedia page has got, it's got, uh, you know, Maybush, Stan Laurel, and Oliver Hardy. I'm going, well, <laughs> yeah. and because and again, because people are seeing it, oh, it's a, it's a Laurel and Hardy film because both the both of them are in it. But what 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 struck me about Love and Weep is it's almost like a it was almost like a a carry on from when when Stan and James worked together for so long. It's the same it's the same partnership. Yeah. And again, you think you you maybe think that film had been filmed like a few years earlier when they were they were effectively a, their own, a double act together. Yeah. Like I say, it seems weird to go back having discovered that Stan and Ollie worked so well together of what seems like the first time. If then yeah. went for the next one, they went oh, they've got they've got no clue sort of thing. And they go oh, you know James and Stan know how they can work together. Let's get them. Or whether it's just their turn, I don't know. I don't, it's like. But there again, I mean, Stan and James did work very well together, didn't they? You know, it was it wasn't as if they didn't work well together. So I suppose uh, it was a tried and tested formula that worked very well. So you know, whether it was Bay Party or whether it was James Finlayson, it, it was going to work either way, I suppose. No, 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 no. I recently found an, a a wee snippet that said basically James was signed by Hal Roach specifically to partner Stan Laurel which I found really interesting. The first couple of films he does, it's it Hal Roach with Snub Pollard, who again, he seems to have a friendship with because Snub, Pla- Snub Pollard was one of the guys at James' funeral. Yeah, so the, like I say, the Hal Roach, the, first, the, the very first thing that like, what I was working back from uh, Laurel and Hardy was discovering how many films he was in with Stan Laurel. I was like, I don't, nobody's ever mentioned this. And this is so, the thing, I mean, one of the questions I was going to actually ask you is, you know, I know we're, we're sort of sneaking forward slightly, but, um, you know, when you've got the, the sort of the Hal Roach All-Stars and you've got um, Stan and Babe and James Finlayson, they were very, they appeared to be very much um, a team of three, you know. I mean, there was yeah. obviously others as well, but those three, you know, as it went on, very right up until the, kind of the moment, uh, you know, sort of um, the, the second hundred years, um, when the if sort of the boys officially became a team, Finn was right in there. You know, he was he was one of the main kind of actors. But then suddenly it was almost I wouldn't say it was cast aside, but he was kind of almost relegated to supporting player. And it just it seems quite unfair because he's such a good member of the team. He's you know he's just as important. And I know Stan Laurel in in um, uh, in later life always acknowledged the fact that James Finlayson. Um, was one of the reasons why they became so so memorable as a team, as a comedy team. Um, so it just seems quite unfair to me that he did get kind of, I don't want to say relegated or demoted, because it, it, it's still such a fabulous role that he plays. But obviously it became Laurel and Hardy. And, and, and like you just said, in later life, he was re- remembered more for his Keystone Cops than he was for the Laurel and Hardy supporting actors. You know, how, do you, how did you feel about that? Well... One of the things I would say is that basically James James quit Hal Roach in September, end of September 1927, which I think might explain why Law and Hardy were, then became promoted as a, a double act. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. he wasn't there. James yeah, wasn't yeah there that's anymore. right. He made it easy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I haven't if I like, completed my, my research in the Law and Hardy days, if you like, but um, I recently came across a notice in, I think, an Australian newspaper for Hats Off, and it lists all three of them. What I've tried to figure out is, Okay, if, if James quit in late September, October 27, what film was actually in production around yeah. that time or before, just before then? Yeah, so we so we don't know why why he quit. No, I mean, part, part of me is thinking maybe he had a contract dispute, whether it was about money. 
I don't really know. Um, it could be. It could be. One of the things I found interesting about James is, I'm trying to think, it was it exactly four years he was with Hal Roach? Because it was it'd be exa almost exactly four years he was with Pirates. Okay, with, with the four year age. Does he have, well, yeah. <laughs> Does he get bored, you know? Yeah, could be. Because um, the other weird thing is, when in the 19, 1933 to thirty five, he goes over to London to make quote the quickie movies for Warner Brothers. And he, he leaves in April 1933 and returns in April 1935. So it's almost exactly two years to the day. So is he one of these guys that has his, his career planned out in chunks? Because you certainly can't imagine um, dispute amongst the three of them. It's such a great team, you know, together. And the more you, know, the more you read about Stan Laurel and, and Oliver Hardy, they, they were very generous, you know, people. I don't think they would have been had a problem with... Um, sharing the limelight with you know the, between the three of them, I don't think that would have been an issue. I think Stan originally didn't want to have a comedy partner. I think he wanted to be a solo, but he realised he was better when he had somebody to to bounce off. So um, no, it's an interesting one that one. Well, it's, it's interesting if you go through the, I think it's eighteen films that James made with Stan. That initially, you know, he's like he is he, playing that villain character, if you like. But other ones, he's not. He's they're, they're like. They're like buddies kind of thing. Um, I think Scotch and Sands one that springs to mind. Oliver Hardy also made films with, with James uh, when James went solo. And I think one of them was directed by Stan Laurel. Yeah, I think yes, I think yes, yes in the net. And there's, that, there's, there's a one called, what's it called? Uh, it's like a cowboy film. Um, no Man's Law. No Man's Law. It's basically Star, Star's Rex, the Wonder Horse. Yes, yeah. The horse gets the leading credits. <laughs> Um, and 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 Oliver Hardy's playing a, a, a real baddie. Yes, it's not. A, yeah, it's a bit of a nasty film, isn't it? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's quite dark. Uh, and then let's say, and, and there's a one called Madam Mystery that James is in with Fida Barrow, Barra, sorry. And Oliver Hardy's this appears as the captain, and it's like, where did he come from? So, like I say, I, I, also they're all under contract. How Roach? So they seem to be asked to do different. Parts. Some of the main character, some the main role. Sometimes they're just a wee, a wee side character, if you like. A lot of our listeners are, are obviously going to be very familiar with um, the the Laurel and Hardy films that uh, that uh, James Finlayson appears in. Um, but from your point of view, with the research that you've done, are there any kind of non Laurel Hardy films with James that fans should seek out? What do you think are kind of the best ones? Yeah, I was going to say that from the Max Sennett era, I would. Definitely recommend um, watching Down in the Farm, purely purely because of the quality of the film that's, that's been restored. Because um, a lot of these, well, a lot of films you can actually watch on YouTube have been, you know, copied and recopied, and the quality is really poor. Down the Farm is really, really uh, quite clear. Um, you can find small small town idol, which again is, is basically James versus Ben Turpin, but. The, Quality, the one I've found is very poor, it's very dark. And the sound, the soundtrack they put on it's awful. So I'd recommend you mute, you mute that one. <laughs> but it's very interesting to, to see, you know, like say James with playing playing with Ben Turpin. As regards to the if you like the Stan Laurel partnership when they made so many films together, I think Scorch and Sands is quite good. Um just because it's it's well it's, again the quality is quite good and also the it's a quite a, quite a light storyline, but they're, they're kind of Stan's and, and James are very much equal partners rather than you know, James playing the villain role, if you like. The other one, the one that was worth having a look at is the, the Soilers. Yeah. Um, especially for the, the, the fight scene with, with James yeah. and, <laughs> yeah. and Stan fighting. And I, I, always, I always wonder, and again, I don't know if you watch um, Family Guy, uh, you know how every so often Peter has a fight with a chicken. I always wonder if they got that from from that film because, you know, they're, they're, that way they're they're rolled about fighting and then I think a guy walks into the room and they stop, <laughs> and they kind of look at him yeah, and he goes out the room and then start fighting again. <laughs> it's the same kind of sort of same kind of yeah, idea. And as regards other films, sort of solo films, if you like, not solo films, but Madam Mystery is quite interesting again because well, because law because uh, Oliver Hardy appears in that and. The four mentioned yes, yes, in the net, which I think James has got a ridiculous wig on, which becomes the subject of a joke in the film. I mean, it's like I say, there's so many films. I mean, 
what I'm trying to find out is if I find any of the, the ones James made in, in the UK. Yeah, I mentioned that he made those quote the quickie films. Certainly the, the British Film Archive has a note of like the credits, etc. I don't know if you can actually, if any of them are, are available to view. Um, we seem to play a lot of policemen in them, a lot of police constables, etc. Whether that's related to them being a keystone cop, or, or at least the perception is a keystone cop. Because that's that's, a, that's quite an interesting time, that the, the fact that they, they picked James to go over there with, with Clyde Cook. I, f- I found a few movie gossip items in, in some of the periodicals at the time. Apparently it was James. James was well known for throwing, throwing wild parties. Oh, was he? Okay. I was in London. Um, and also been been apparently the, the city's sharpest dresser. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, that's, that's his publicist saying that. <laughs> I think some of the articles for Native Tuntal Arbor and the Fog Herald mentioned mention his shoes being, you know, he wore a bees at the shoes he was wearing. You know, these uh, little shell brogues. Uh, I think he's a, he's a fascinating character. Just the fact that he's, today he's, the perception is... He was only a supporting character in, in Laurel and Hardy, and the fact that he had he was in so many other films has is, is become is, is kind of amazed me really. He was so much of a star even in like the Max Sennett days, when the the newspapers are reporting the fact he goes back to Scotland for his holidays. I thought, why are they saying this about this this wee Scottish guy? Apparently, he's he's seen as being as, as you know important enough to get a mention in the papers. Do you know what kind of a person he was just personally? I mean, is there any kind of... I mean, you said you mentioned letters that he, he'd, he'd written, you know, back to Scotland and so on. Is, is there any kind of clue as to what kind of a guy he was? I mean, was he, you know, happy-go-lucky or...? Well, I think, that, like, Randy's book has has a couple of references to minor actors talking about all three of the, the boys of your life. I think he said that, you know, he's, they're saying he's, he's quite a, you know, a kind of good guy and he's a bit of a practical joker. Okay. Yeah. I think there's a mention of, I think the, uh, is it Stan's got a new car or something? I think it's lo- uh, loving you call them the loving hisses. Yeah, you know the army one. Yeah, and they're filming that. I think Stan had a, a new car or something like that, and apparently they, t- they took the distributor cap off, and it was an end. Up, it was actually in James's pocket, sort of thing. So, <laughs> uh, I like the, like the story about the, the strip poker and things like that. He's obviously, I was just saying, he's obviously fond of a drink. Yes. Yeah. Um, and as you can see from a lot of the photographs, he was he was, fun, he was a quite a heavy smoker. Yeah. Um, which actually did from for him in the end because of, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, is is it right he, that his his career suffered because he uh, because of health problems later on? Well, well, that's what I mean. I've read I've read that. Um, I mean, certainly he's, the the cause of death on his death certificate is uh, coronary sclerosis, which I believe is a, a build up of plaque in your arteries. And one of the one of the what they call it the contributing factors is is smoke smoking, which I would guess um, you know played a part in it. Although I've said that in his family there is a there is a history of heart issues. Um, he, like I say, his mother died of a heart issue, and so did his his, his older sister. So. Yeah, I mean, there's one, there's a film, I, saw, I, think it's a, I don't know if it's a TV film, it's like a wee short comedy, it's called Dog On, um, it's, a bit, it's a stupid thing about him, he accidentally I think he eats the dog, the dog food or something like that and thinks he's going to die, sort of thing, um, but only all the faces he pulls as usual sort of thing, but I was, I was looking at it and I was going, he's like, I think he was like, um, let's see, he was 1940, he looks. He looks terrible. You think he he's been he's been on the the sauce too much or whatever. <laughs> uh, too, too much partying. You know what I mean? I hadn't uh, caught and done to me before that how how how, a, how long prohibition was, and b you know the fact that that's gone on around the time these guys were making movies. I remember seeing something about a a venue in Hollywood. It was like I don't know if it's the to the Hollywood Legion or something. Um, it's one of these venues that he's talked about it being at in the in the papers, and it's like they had apparently the the whole secret bar behind, you know, like a, a whole thing about the you know the wall rotated round and there's a a bar up here. Oh, it's Bugsy Malone. And that, you know, if the, if the cops come round, they all turn around again. So yeah. There's all, but obviously there was a lot of these. A lot of also went on, you know. Um, 
because you can't imagine all these these movie people, you know, <laughs> being sober. <laughs> really. I think one, that's probably maybe one of the things that he's, you know, maybe his career faded, as, and he's obviously got a thick Scottish accent. Um, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how you find mine, but uh, <laughs> yeah, obviously, you know, talk, when talkies came out, he wasn't going to be able to hold long, have long dialogue scenes, I wouldn't have thought with. I think he does. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I mean, I, my, my comment I was going to make about that was that I think along with Stan and Babe, I think he transferred very well from Silent films to to talk he's um i mean yes he's got a thick scottish accent but you can certainly tell what he's saying there's absolutely no problem with that and it it matches his character it's exactly what you you would think he looks like i mean i guess i'm looking at it because i i would have seen him in talkies first but it does match what you would expect him to sound like you know he's perfect you wouldn't want it any other way really so i don't i don't imagine that would have held him back at all was he uh, was he a married man um stephen did he have family? Yeah, he, well, he married he married a young girl who was I think was nineteen at the time, and I'm like I think it was nineteen, well, it might be nineteen nineteen when they signed his Max Senate contract. I did wonder if I, I believe she was from Iowa. I did wonder if maybe she might have been one of the bathing beauties. Basically, the marriage didn't last very long. I think it was about maybe five years. He lists himself as in one of his applications for U.S. citizenship as being. We well, actually said he's divorced which I found no rec- no record of. I did find out that when James passed away, he was found by an actress called Stephanie Insel. She's described as his regular breakfasting companion. <laughs> <laughs> which, which seems it seems innocent enough at, at first, but then you think, is that is that some kind of euphemism? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so basically I've discovered that um, they actually they were actually engaged at one point. Um, and I, I now wonder, did they did they not get married because he wasn't actually divorced? I.e., they couldn't marry. Right. Yeah, that would make um, sense, wouldn't it? Now she, I think they met when James was over in London. Um, like I say, making those quotey, quicky quota movies. Because she seems to have followed him. I think about six months after he returned, um, she thought she came across to California, which seems very odd because she was a very minor actress. Um, and I believe, I believe, like I say, I believe they met at maybe perhaps one of James's parties while he was entertaining in London. I think, I think she was, I think she was divorced, or she certainly got divorced around that time. Um, and I, actually, they they were both actually, um, they were both witnesses in the divorce case of Clyde Cook, which proves, I feel like, proves they're both in London at the same time. Um, I, I, well, I'm going to the details of the, the court case, but that's when I, I made I made the connect well made the connection. But then I found a, a later article which said they were they were engaged in 1939. I think so. I think they were also definitely you know in a in a relationship. I mean, they just frowned upon that they were. Um, also, they were I don't think they were living together because her address was further along on a different road, quite nearby. Um. But they're also very close. So he didn't have any children at all. James himself never had any children. Um, so I was like, then looked at you know he's, so he's got two brothers and he's got three sisters. So his I think his younger brother Robert, I believe Robert only had like step a step child, I think. Um, but his older brother um, Alexander had a son called Alex. Now he actually became a assistant director. I dare say he was talented, but I dare say James put in a good word for him <laughs> in the studios. So he was actually he's actually credited on um I think the, the Great Dictator with Charles Chaplin and also uh, a jump at Oxford. And I then thought, oh great, so he might have children that are still alive. But unfortunately he died, I think he died of a brain hemorrhage or something in his forties. So what's quite exciting is last year I made contact um well a, a number of uh, third cousins, I we all share the same great great grandfather because the the family of James Henderson, uh, James's grandfather, are quite quite large. So we met up and we actually went to one of the Laurel Hardy showings at the Britannia Panopticon in Glasgow in Trongate, um, which is an old music hall. It's, it's where Stan Laurel made his his, his debut. So uh, we met up there with third cousin who's uh, Alistair Young, 
So he made basically made contact with this woman who he thought might be James's grandniece. And it turned out we were correct. So her name is, is Jean Hansen, and she lives in, in Tennessee. So she she and Alistair and I are all our third cousins again because we've got the same great great grandfather. And Jean actually Jean actually remembers um, meeting uh, James's brother Robert. She was a young child, and she's in fact her, it was her father who acted as the executor for for uh, Robert's estate. So basically, uh, her father inherited all, if you like, James's memorabilia. So she has a, a, a veritable treasure trove of of family photographs. Um, which I've seen a few of them. It's amazing the uh, just to, to see the the family and again it stresses how important family was to James and um, there's a great there's a great photograph of when the the whole all the siblings met up and um, when that when the, the elder brother had, had emigrated across he was the last one emigrated across and they all met up in New York you know so that uh, Robert and James must have came across from California so we've now, we've now discovered all these relatives across in in America that we didn't know existed so we decided we'd form a uh, Sons of the Desert tent. So I'm coming up with the name Our Relations because obviously we're all related to James. Yeah, it's perfect. Um, and we sort of, so we had a, we had a, a sort of a launch at the at the Panopticon, um, connecting from live from the states, if you like. And it was it was it was quite quite amazing, really. And we got a, we got a good good reaction from the crowd that were there. So how much? So is the tent just fam, just relations of yeah of yeah? We, we made there? this weird. <laughs> weird thing, weird rule if you like that you must you must be a a proven relative. So we've had a few other people come out of the shadows if you like who we didn't know existed. Um we still haven't found an actual Finlayson, but there must there must be one out there. because um, James had quite quite a large or I said his brother had a large family. But it's it's great. Again, like sharing stories about oh, how did you know when did you get told that James was famous, you know? And everyone knows there's a connection, but um, you know, nobody really knew the, the whole story, if you like. So it's great to just to connect that way, you know, that's what makes all the research worthwhile, you know. One of the, like saying mentioned about how uh, James's nephew, Alex, was an assistant director. So when so Robert had trained as, a, as an, an, an engineer and he became a, a camera technician out in the States. Right. And when the older brother Alexander came across, I think he initially worked as a grip, but later on he's 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 referred to as a studio exec at MGM. So again, maybe more strings were pulled <laughs> by James. But um, what I found fascinating talking to, to Gene and, and and other relatives is that there's a few of the films you can see some of the, some of the earlier ones anyway. In fact, it's one of the all other ones as well. Is that James's brothers are actually in the background? There's one of the I can't remember which one. There's one of the Max Sennett ones. Was a, there's a still from the uh, one of the, the crowd scenes, and, and James is sitting right beside his brother. Uh, you know, his brother's just playing an extra in the crowd, sort of thing. Uh, I can't remember which I can't remember which Hardy one it is. Um, oh, is it Alex Men at War? I think it is. Oh, is um, it? Okay. I think it's the one. It's one with the there's a, a beer garden scene. So I reckon he's at his brother Alex, Alex Alexander, or Alex is in that, and it's actually I think it's it's actually credited on the, I think in the AFI catalog as well. So it's interesting that although he, you know he's obviously got his brothers and convinced them to come across to California and got them jobs in the industry, you know, yeah, so he's he's definitely keeping it in the family, you know. Yeah, I was going to say family is important to him, as you said, isn't it? And uh, just one of the last questions I've got for you, Stephen, just to uh, to wrap things up. What I'd like to do is just ask um, my guests, you know, if, is there any particular projects that you may, may be working on that you'd like to plug? Um, I know at one time you were working on a, a biography of uh, of James. Is that still in the offing? Yep. Yeah, uh, initially, initially I set up my uh, website just to, well, it was actually to, fund, to kind of crowdsource a biography. And hope right. other people would chip in. <laughs> yeah. But uh, 
I just decided to be, well, I wasn't getting much feedback, so I decided to kind of do it myself. Yeah. Um, so I guess, like I say, about the filmography, I didn't realise how much work was involved. Um, there, is a, there is a biography of James out there. Um, is there? Which I've got a copy of. Um, it's called, so what, let me see it with that. Yeah. It's also what about Finn? But it's basically, oh, wow. it's, it's not very good. Um, and it's mostly a, it's mostly a, like a cut and paste of other, you know, of bit, snippets from other sources. Right, okay. Uh, to kind of patch the story together. Yeah. And, the, and most of it talks about the, the author's trip to, to, well, to Falkirk and Larbert to try and find, you know, the sites where James grew up. But he gets a lot of the things wrong. Um, like I say, it's not really good. So I'm hoping I can do do a bit better. Yeah, well, the website's lovely. I mean, can, do you want to just give the, the website address out so people can find a bit more information about uh, James? So the, the website's um, jamesfinlison.actor. Yeah. Um, so it's quite easy to remember. Yeah. Um, although I noticed the, the dot .actor domain is actually blocked in my work. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe it wasn't a good choice. Um, well, but, I've never had any problems getting onto it. It's it's a really nice yeah. site, isn't it? Really nicely put together. Well, apart me, so I started off with the idea. I thought maybe people people want to see clips to maybe mm. get interest. So I started off when I, when I started discovering the, the old films, just putting putting some clips together. Um, I did put some biography details on, so I'm going to do more of that. I think just put yeah. more stuff on about. Mm. Um, Maybe a mix, a mix of you know movie stuff, if you like, and yeah. uh, just general biography. Yeah. Um, but certainly, I mean, like I say, I've got the I've got the outline of my chapters. Um, it's it's I'm, I'll admit it's slow putting it all together. Yeah. Um, part of me is a bit of a perfect perfectionist, if you like. But yeah. Part of me is thinking, look, just just get the rough bones. Yeah, get, get out of there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, it's, you know, it's your second edition and tidy up, you know. Of course, you can revise it. And when the thing is, if you you know, if you do it as a um, a, an ebook as well, an online book, you can adapt that as you go along if you want to. Anyway, can't you? Always do updates. But uh, I think a, I think a James Finlayson biography is is very much required. Um, certainly for the completist out there, you know, we've we've had uh, John Orla's book on Charlie Hall fairly recently, so. Mm. I think sitting next to that's got to be uh, got to be one on James Finlayson, and who better to write it than uh, a family member? <laughs> Brilliant. Well, it's, it's definitely it's written from a if you like a family point of view. Yeah, storyline will be, you know, that'll be part integral part of the story. Um, yeah, not just a not just a sort of chronological filmography. Yeah, um, exactly, and that sounds like a really interesting story as well. Uh, I think that wraps it up, Stephen. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and to learn more about uh, to, the, the wonderful James Finlayson. And um, would you be able to go back on if uh, if we um, look at any more? Well, we will certainly look at more f- uh, films with James Finlayson. Would you would you come back and join us again another time? Definitely, yeah. It's been good fun. Wonderful, oh, wonderful. Thank you ever so much, mate. Thanks for thanks for being with us. Thank you. And that about wraps up episode three. Um, at the time of recording, we're roughly four days away from Stan Laurel's birthday, the 16th of June. And on the same day, the eagerly anticipated new Blu-ray and DVD release of Laurel and Hardy's definitive restorations. This looks like such a fantastic release. It contains all new HD restorations from 35mm prints of many of the best of the boys' films, including Sons of the Desert, Way Out West... Um, we've also got uh, oh the nearly complete Battle of the Century, of course. Uh, really exciting release this one. Lots of special features, um, and tons of interviews from Randy Scrapvet's collection. Uh, it really is a, um, a a release to be uh, savored. I think this one, and I'm looking forward to hopefully for my birthday, uh, which is just at the end of June. So uh, fingers crossed they can get that shipped across to the UK for me in time. Um, if you haven't already pre-ordered your uh, copy of that, you can find links to that on my website. Um, also on the Amazon store as well. So, um, yeah, look out for that one. As usual, thank you so much to all the authors of the books that I use to write my blogs, and special thanks to Pete Schroeder and all involved at the Bohunks Orchestra for the superb music.
Thank you once again to the wonderful Stephen Retty for joining us today, being our special guest. I really enjoyed uh, learning more about James Finlayson. He's always been one of my favourites, so uh, today was, uh, yeah, that was a real pleasure to speak to Stephen. Um, and most of all, of course, thank you to you all for joining me and, uh, and sharing this time with us. And one final reminder, don't forget to come and join us on the Blogheads Facebook group. You're all more than welcome. Um, and also, don't forget to drop in and check out my new Amazon Laurel and Hardy blog store. And all that's left is to say goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. Mustn't forget, goodbye from him. Well, goodbye. And goodbye from me. Goodbye.